A major media merger appears to be about to happen. Plus, the NHL finals are set, and Real Madrid signed one of the top players in the world. It's Tuesday, June 4th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NHL Stanley Cup Finals matchup is set, with the Edmonton Oilers facing the Florida Panthers, who lost in last year's final to the Vegas Golden Knights. Edmonton and the Panthers home of Sunrise, Florida, are 2,543 miles apart, which is the furthest distance between any two Stanley Cup finalists in history. For the NHL, this matchup will be a major test of whether it can keep its momentum going after the first two rounds were its most watched ever, according to the league. That's coming off of a regular season that was the most watched since the 2015-2016 season and the most watched on cable in 30 years. The NHL narrowly missed having a final with two of its largest markets in New York and Dallas. Instead, it's getting one with a team that could be building long-term loyalty with cup runs in consecutive years and Connor McDavid, the top player in the sport. If the Oilers can take home the cup, an entire nation will celebrate. The last time a Canadian team won the cup was the Montreal Canadiens in 1993. That is the nation's longest drought in its history. Real Madrid just won the Champions League on Saturday. To celebrate, they are now bringing in the superstar they have wanted for years, Kylian Mbappe. Madrid worked out a transfer agreement that will send Mbappe from Paris Saint-Germain on a five-year deal that starts with a $136 million signing bonus and then pays him $16 million to $22 million per season. He retains 80% of his image rights. The top Spanish team is undergoing a $1.4 billion renovation of its stadium, Santiago Bernabeu, but they'll get a financial boost of at least $92 million from winning the Champions League on Saturday. The club was also the top revenue generator among the European soccer teams for the 2023 financial year, with a haul of $916 million. For the championship, a new superstar and a newly renovated stadium reopening, possibly in January, Real Madrid is at the top of the soccer world. Paramount and Skydance have, I believe, agreed to, in principle, a merger. Joining me now to discuss is CNBC media reporter Alex Sherman. Welcome, Alex. Happy to be here, as always, Owen. Yeah, great to have you back on. So we've talked about this potential deal for a while now. Uh, what do we know about the um, the deal that I understand is not a done deal, but is agreed to, in principle, between Paramount and Skydance? So there was some back and forth between the Skydance Consortium and the Paramount Special Committee over the weekend, where uh, the Skydance Consortium, which is Skydance Media and two private private equity firms, KKR and Redbird Capital, um, which is run by a guy named Jerry Cardinale and also now uh, Jeff Schell, the former NBC Universal CEO, is part of that. So was Jeff Zucker, by the way. They're all uh, uh, partners at Redbird at this stage. Um, that consortium upped its the, 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 the bid, the joint bid for Paramount Global, in particular to the Class B shareholders. Uh, so it was about a 5% raise in price to sweeten the deal for Class B shareholders. Not all of them will be taken out of this transaction. This is not a full take private, but uh, it, 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 the, the, the most recent thing I've heard is that uh, the Skydance Consortium will own about two-thirds of the new company. So that is up from the original talks of this, which was closer to somewhere in the 45 to 50% ownership rate. So in other words, they're going to, to theoretically buy out more common shareholders and pay them more money. Now, why are they doing this? Well, the special committee needs to approve the deal. Um, and then beyond that, Sherry Redstone, the controlling shareholder, needs to approve the deal. Now, part of this deal is that Sherry will be paid a significant control premium for her stake, which has always been why this has been uh, a preferred outcome for Sherry Redstone, at least in theory. Now, this deal is still not done. Redstone is going to have to look at the revised proposal, which, as I said, was submitted over the weekend. Paramount Global has its annual meeting tomorrow, so we're recording this on Monday. It is Tuesday. will be the annual meeting. Uh, I am told no decision will be reached before that annual meeting. Uh, after the annual meeting, there will be a board presentation of the current leadership, which will also present during the annual meeting. And then after that, I would imagine we may hear, you know, a thumbs up or a thumbs down from Redstone on the new Skydance offer. Got it. And so... 
Um, Sony came in with a late-ish offer, right? Is that why essentially this this offer is getting sweetened to kind of get close enough to there so that they can avoid the complications around dealing with a, a foreign company and um, you know, if the money's close enough, they're going to take the Skydance deal, it sounds like. So to rewind a little bit, what happened here was for about six months-ish, Paramount Global, mainly Sherry Redstone, who owns this uh, uh, national amusements uh, holding company, which is the controlling shareholder of Paramount Global, has been in discussions with this Skydance consortium over this two-step deal, which would, in, in essence, take her out uh and then merge its assets with Paramount Global while later on in the game also paying out various different Class B shareholders. That deal almost got to the finish line. But on May 3rd, its exclusive window, the negotiating window, which was a 30-day-ish window, uh, ran out. And the special committee said, we're not going to accept your offer. And why? It was because of what you just said, that there was sort of a late offer thrown in by Sony and Apollo combined that the special committee felt like it needed to review in order to do its responsibilities, its Revlon responsibilities, try to come up with the best deal for shareholders to maximize shareholder value of the company. So that has been going on over the past few weeks. They have been examining that deal. uh, And clearly, uh, seemingly, we've come to the doorstep now where they've concluded that that deal, you know, is not all it's cracked up to be either, They didn't feel comfortable with the financing. We don't really know exactly yet why the special committee sort of turned on that deal. Um, It's possible that it was regulatory issues, as you said. Uh, I know that the Skydance Consortium thought all along that that deal was sort of air uh, and that eventually the special committee would come back around to them. In fact, they said it privately. I was told, hey, don't go anywhere. Like, we need to take a look at this, but it's not like we're off you guys. So... Let us do our due diligence. We need to do it for legal reasons. And then if we decide that your bid is, in fact, the best one, you know, we'll re-engage. And so that's why I think we saw the Skydance Consortium sweeten their bid a little bit. Because clearly the special committee went to them and said, hey, look, look, you guys up the offer a little bit. You know, maybe we'll finally get to you and we'll say, okay. And this annual meeting, which, which goes along with the departure of four different board members, three of which have been on the special committee. Uh, is this week. So it sort of was a natural uh, deadline-ish to try to get something done. So even if we don't hear anything before tomorrow's annual meeting, you figure you want to at least have a go-forward plan as you bring in these new board members. They're not going to do that originally, but they are going to at least have to set up what the company looks like for the future. And in terms of whether this you know, actually happens and the deal is finalized, is it just in Cherry Redstone's hands now? Like, is it just she decides yes or no? Yeah, exactly. So I, I think where that's where the stage we're at now. So she's going to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. The special committee had to approve the deal. So we, we've got that part of it uh, out of the way at this point. That's what we reported today. My colleague David Faber saying like they've reached a framework where they're comfortable with the deal. Now it's on Cherry Redstone. And the likely outcomes for Sherry Redstone here is either she approves the deal, which, you know, the fact that she's gone this far down the line signals that uh, you'd have to imagine that's a high likelihood. The only thing I think logically that might stand in the way is if for some reason, and, and I'm told that she has been happy with the leadership of the current three people running Paramount Global, which is uh, the head of CBS, George Cheeks, the head of the Paramount Media Networks, Chris McCarthy, and also Showtime, you know, MTV, et cetera, the cable networks, uh, and Brian Robbins, who runs Paramount Pictures. So those three Paramount leaders have been running the company since April 29th when Bob Bakish was fired or whatever word you want to use. I mean, essentially fired, uh, let go uh, as CEO. Uh, it's possible that Redstone would say, you know what? I actually like the direction that these three people have in mind for the company. So we don't need to do a deal yet. Let's just kind of see them run it for a while um, and, and you know, see where that goes in terms of value creation. Or she could decide, okay, now's the time. I've been negotiating with Skydance uh, for long enough. Finally, we're at the finish line here. Let me just do a deal, and that will indicate my own departure from the company and also a new leadership change as David Ellison would become the CEO of the new company uh, and Jeff Shell would have a major uh, leadership position within that. And yeah, let's look down that path of the deal goes through, uh, Ellison takes over. What's 
what's that going to mean, do you think, in terms of, you know, Paramount's future and, you know, specifically, um, are they going to be a continue, continue to be a major player in sports media? Uh, cause, you know, they got the NFL, they got a bunch of PGA Tour rights, Big Ten, March Madness, a whole lot of soccer, actually. So, yeah, is that going to continue to be part of uh, who they are? So we don't know for sure because they haven't come out and said this is our plan because they haven't acquired the company yet. But from the discussions I've had privately, it sounds like they would be committed to staying in the sports game. Skydance has an existing relationship with the NFL on a number of productions, so that is not a foreign relationship. Uh, and, and from what I'm told, CBS would continue to be a part of their plan. That would be different than the uh, Sony Apollo offer, where that was sort of contingent on breaking up the company. Uh, the reason Sherry Redstone has gone this far down the road with Skydance is Skydance uh, that consortium has worked really hard to keep the company together to come up with a plan and a price that they're willing to pay for the asset where they feel like they can more or less keep the company as one and move forward. That's not to say that there won't be divestments of certain assets. That is part of the plan. I'm also told that they will look to divest certain parts of the company. Think about like BET, for instance, which almost got sold last year. Like that may be an asset I could easily see uh, uh, being shipped away uh, to potentially to a, um, a, a an owner that has more minority ties, which was the original plan, uh, as there are certain uh, advertiser benefits if a mi minority owner owns a uh, media company that is geared toward uh, a, a minority audience. Um, so there's certain synergies there that exist. But by and large, the plan purposefully has been to keep the company together because Sherry Redstone doesn't want it ripped apart, which is one of the reasons among the regulatory and, and financing reasons, why the Skydance Consortium kind of thought, thought that the Sony Apollo offer was a non-starter. Because if that offer was predicated on ripping this thing apart, that wasn't going to be what Sherry Redstone wanted. Yeah. And how much do you think it's going to matter if we go from, you know, this being a Sherry Redstone controlled company to, yeah, something more of a consortium, obviously, with individual humans at the top of it. But are we going to see kind of more of a private equity approach to, to this like major legacy media company? Well, I mean, with two private equity firms being co-owners of it, you'd have to imagine that would be part of it, naturally. Uh, I do think that David Ellison has uh, goals of being a major player in media, so that may rub against the pure private equity part of this. We'll have to see what his plan is in terms of, does he have a radical change of strategy in streaming? You know, Paramount Plus has like over 70 million subscribers at this point, that's a lot, but it does still lose money. So one of the things I think all, the entire investment community is going to be looking for is a clear statement on the direction of streaming. Do we want to keep going with Paramount Plus? Do we want to merge it with Peacock, which has been, you know, kind of bandied about for several years? NBC Universal has had some interest in doing that. Bob Backish uh, had, did, did not have interest in doing that, thinking Paramount Plus was actually the stronger of the two services. Uh, but it, but it, the fact of the matter is, is that streaming business keeps losing money. So it may behoove the new Skydance Consortium and the private equity players who are conditioned not to lose money, um, even if it's sort of a long-term strategy, uh, that they may want to reverse course there. So I would say that's maybe the first thing the investment community will look for, uh, is, it, is a clear statement of what the plan is with Paramount Plus moving forward. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I was about to ask if you foresee, yeah, again, assuming this deal does in fact happen, ripple effects with, yeah, Comcast, Disney, Fox, I guess, the, the other legacy, you know, you know, you can get them over the rabbit ears that those, those major media companies, how are they going to react to all this? Yeah, so I, I've gotten this question from others too, Owen. My take on this, to be honest, is that I don't know that there will be any real ripple effects. Like, I, I think the way this deal is structured, it's kind of just a leadership refresh. So, um, you know, there will be new people in charge. And there will be a new strategy for, for Paramount Global. But unless they start to make major changes from a divestment standpoint, in other words, maybe they carve off all of the linear cable networks. If we see that, then I think that might be a catalyst for all the other media companies to say, okay, finally now, it's time to rationalize our own assets here. And maybe we'll divest our own legacy cable companies. And there's probably a handful of private equity firms and maybe even one or two 
publicly traded companies that might be interested in picking off those you know dying cable networks that still make some money to try to build a new company of scale. That is a perfect private equity strategy. But I've reported in the past that when Stars is uh, separated from Lionsgate, Lionsgate will be technically separated from Stars, I guess, but there'll be two different companies. That Jeff Hirsch, the CEO at Stars, his part of his strategy is to maybe uh, gain scale by picking off some of these cable networks uh, if they're in fact uh, you know put on the market. So that may be uh, uh, the the major catalyst to change rather than simply the transaction happening because you're left with Warner Brothers Discovery, NBC Universal, which is owned by Comcast, Disney, uh, you know the the big tech guys like Warner Brothers Discovery clearly wants to do some deal at some point long term. I mean, they, I, th I think that's a well known fact that that company did the, when Warner Media and Discovery came together. That was sort of just a stepping stone for the next deal, whenever that may happen. But that was going to happen regardless of Paramount. The, the only question there is, would some asset within Paramount or the whole company itself, in fact, be the merger partner with Warner Brothers Discovery? So this deal indicates that at least that's not going to happen immediately. But it doesn't really change the landscape all that much, uh, unless some of the assets are divested. In other words, if they say, you know what, we decided we don't want CBS. Well, then Warner, Warner Brothers Discovery would be a theoretical natural home for CBS. It doesn't own the broadcast network, and that would really strengthen that company and give it scale. It would give it football, for instance, you know, so it would just kind of get back in the sports game. So that would be a, a, a big landscape shifting deal. Other than that, you know, I, from from what I know, Comcast is quite content to own NBC Universal and build up that media company. Disney has its own thing going on, uh, certainly, uh, and it will have to go through a succession change, and then that new CEO will need to decide what it wants to do. You know, and then I think the big tech companies are more or less either happy with where they are or simply stuck where they are for regulatory reasons. Huh. All right, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like. You know, everything's changing, but it's it's like watching like the tectonic plates like shift over time where it's like, yeah, you can see a whole lot of changes. You don't know like where it's all going to end up, but like it's also just kind of kind of take forever. And I will say that one of the main reasons I think this deal is happening is that it does not ring the same regulatory alarm bells that so many of those other deals would ring, particularly in this administration, which has been very tight uh, on, on big either tech deals or or even the idea, I think, of putting two of these big media mergers, uh, media companies together in a large media merger has really spooked a lot of the boards and leadership to the point where they've said, you know what, it's just not the right time for us to try this yet. Yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like, you know, some of these mid-sized streaming companies are in a bit of a bind where they, they probably have to get, you have to merge, you know, like maybe if it's a, a Paramount and a Peacock or, or whatever, uh, maybe WPD gets in there, I don't know. But uh, to, you know, to compete with Amazon, Apple, uh, Netflix. At the same time, they, they've got the, the administration on the other end of it saying like, uh, like, how big are you getting here? Because we might not, you know, we, we, we might at least give you a legal headache, if not stop the whole thing. You also now have a very long track record, you know, Discovery Scripts, Disney Fox, Comcast Sky, Warner Brothers uh, Discovery, Viacom CBS, all large media mergers, none of them have created significant shareholder value. So you just have a big track record of these things not really working out that way. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, thanks for you know giving giving us you know the the current lay of the land here as as it shifts in real time. Alex Sherman, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Alex. That's it for today. Drop us a rating or review wherever you like to listen, or check us out on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.